Morning. Thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Jeanette Stanziano, and I just have some brief housekeeping announcements to go over before we begin. This webinar will be recorded and will be posted with a PDF of the entire slide deck on NYSAC's website anytime after 1 p.m. today. You can find those posting at www.nysac.org backslash webinars. During the program, if you have questions for our speakers, please submit questions through the dashboard. Look for the questions tab and then type in your question and we will respond to your question during the Q&A and reaction panel period at the end of the program. Please note that as I, we said, there will be a recording posted on the website, and you can also find it on YouTube. I'd like to now turn over the program to NYSEC Executive Director, Stephen Aquario. Thank you, Jeanette, and thank you uh, to the county officials that are with us here this morning. Uh, we've got quite a group with us from all across the state, from many different county government agencies, uh, all, again, all parts of the state represented. This is a very important time of the year. This is the time that the governor, state of New York, uh, presents a budget on behalf of the taxpayers to the state legislature, and the legislature begins their deliberations. There's quite a few things that are different this year, though. Uh, the biggest, uh, obvious, most obvious one is we are in the midst of a pandemic, and the legislature will not be convening in person. So that will limit uh, the exposure uh, for the local government officials to meet with their uh, members of the state legislature in their Albany offices. So the role that these legislators have back in the districts, very important uh, for you to maintain strong communication with your state legislature. Okay. But also to stay in touch with the governor's office through your contacts or your regional representatives. Very important time of year. Budget will be done on April 1st. Uh, as it has been uh, every year under the Cuomo administration. I would expect nothing less. Uh, it is a compressed period of time, uh, and it's a lot of money to move through a process, again, in a pandemic year when resources are scarce. So uh, this is an important meeting today. We'll hear from David Lucas, the NYSEC Director of Finance and Intergovernmental Affairs. Uh, on behalf of our president, Jack Marin, the Honorable Jack Marin from Ontario County, New York, I wanna thank you for joining today's special uh, state fiscal year 22 budget presentation. But before we get underway, have a quick webinar sponsor, and I'd like to thank them, Airbnb. Thank Airbnb for sponsoring today's session. We've recorded a quick, brief video we'd like to share right now. Uh, let's turn that video on now, and then I'll pick up right after that. Okay, we're likely having some audio issues, Jeanette. No one can hear uh, Kelly uh, on the uh, presentation here this morning. So why don't we stop that video? Uh, because uh, the, no one can hear that audio. But I do want to thank uh, Airbnb for sponsoring. Uh, Airbnb had a message today to talk about the voluntary collection uh, agreements that they have in place uh, for uh, numerous counties. They are interested in talking to your county about uh, the ability to collect the hotel occupancy tax. 
and they also wanted to announce that the state of New York has proposed the ability to collect sales tax in the governor's budget. And I believe that David Lucas will pick up on that as we get into the panel. Uh, I wanna thank Airbnb again. Uh, and let me see if before we go to David Lucas, if Mark Bolinaro, if we can unmute his cell line, Jeanette, if we're able to pick up uh, Mark Molinaro and yes, we uh, are. see if he could give a few remarks. I know that Mark wanted to say a few things before we got underway. Mark is the president of the New York State County Execs Association. Mark, are you there? Can you hear me okay now? Yes, sir, go right ahead, Oh, Mark. good, there you go, thank you very much, I apologize. Uh, Steve, uh, uh, as uh, I, at first, uh, thanks thanks to everyone on, on the call. Uh, there is little question that this uh, last 12 months has been um, a time unlike any other, but I, I do wanna say, and, and uh, I'm thankful to my colleague, Jack Marin, uh, on behalf of both Jack and myself and really all the counties uh, and county leaders across the state, Steve, to you and the NYSAC staff, um, this budget and the governor's proposed budget really is, um, a, a, in some ways, a culmination of a of a of a long amount of uh, advocacy and work that's been done over these last 12 months in, in unique circumstances. We, um, you and I, and many others, have been around for a while. Uh, we've seen good and we've seen bad come out of uh, state budgets. Uh, this one uh, includes a, a lot of what we've advocated for, uh, certainly over the last uh, uh, last 12 months and. We, I will, I will tell you, and Jack, uh, to those listening, Jack, Jack, and I, and leaders from across the state, have been engaged in in advocacy with the with the division of the budget, uh, the governor's office, and other state leaders uh, over the course of the last several months, really to educate and and hopefully inform them as they prepared for a release of what could have been a catastrophic budget proposal. Yes, uh, we recognize this this one relies on uh, the expectation for state uh, federal aid. Uh, we're hopeful uh, that uh, the federal government uh, uh, takes on the responsibility of assisting state and local governments. We know that that uh, remains a charge for us, but but overall, uh, this budget includes a lot of what we've advocated for and does provide some opportunity for counties that we're grateful for. Uh, I would I would say, uh, and I know that Dave is going to highlight some items that uh, remain a concern, uh, most notably among them, uh, the distressed hospital funding. We're hopeful. Uh, that uh, with the federal aid uh, expected to come to the states and certainly all already some coming to this state in the form of uh, education, some transportation assistance, uh, the, the governor and the state legislature will abandon the distressed hospital proposal uh, as uh, it uh, further uh, rates uh, our sales tax revenue uh, where, and of course, many counties distribute and share that sales tax with local municipalities. So uh, that is just one area that uh, we hope will be revisited. Uh, this budget though does uh, uh, take advantage of a uh, of uh, the advocacy and the work that we uh, really engaged in last year. We're thankful to Senator Schumer and federal leaders, uh, Republican and Democrat in the House and Senate, who really uh, stood with us to ensure protections uh, as relates to Medicaid funding. Uh, this budget reflects uh, no uh, uh, no real, uh, if you will, in, you know, invasion or or, or or a harm in the area of Medicaid as it relates to counties. So we're grateful for that. And uh, um, I, I just want to join Steve and, and everyone else uh, uh, in the organization, encouraging you, those listening, uh, to advocate with state le uh, your legislators. Uh, this is this is a, a time like uh, unlike any other that we really do need to to double down, to reach out to our legislators and to explain both the good and, and some of the areas of concern in this budget, but do it in a personal way, go right to them. I think with, with the use of technology, we don't have to run the halls of the state capitol, just have to flip a switch, uh, get on Zoom, get on a, a Teams meeting and uh, uh, really advocate to, with them. They need to hear from you and I just wanna encourage that we do that. And Steve, if I may, um, out of respect, a lot of people have uh, suffered a great deal of loss this last 12 months. On behalf of all of those listening, listening and the leaders across uh, the state of New York, we join in expressing our condolences to you and the, the loss and the passing of your mother. Uh, we know that she had been ill and we know that you struggled along <clears throat> and uh, sadly joined so many others this last year uh, in, in, uh, in experiencing that loss. But you've got a good family and we love you and uh, we encourage you to continue keeping up the fight on our behalf. So with that, I'll pass back to you. Thank you, County Executive. And thank you for those kind remarks about my family. Thank you very, very much. Uh, 
again, uh, to underscore what the county executive said, uh, this is a very complicated year. There are interconnections with the federal government, a new president, a new Senate, the same House of Representatives, but with a very slim majority. There's no room for error in Washington, D.C. Lots of discussions taking place right now on that next round of COVID relief being proposed by the president. How will that get through the Congress and out to the states? And will it, in fact, include that uh, essential state and local revenue that the county executive was talking about? Uh, very important for you all to remain vigilant with your members of Congress, your state legislators, uh, and the governor. Uh, so let's get underway here. We'll hear from David Lucas again, the Director of Finance and Intergovernmental Affairs. Following David's presentation, we're going to hear our reaction panel. Uh, Jack Marin, the NISAC president from Ontario County, uh, John Becker, the president of the county board chairs, and then, of course, Sean Groden, the president of the County Administrators Association. This is your opportunity to help guide your staff and direct us on issues of concern that may be something that you want to flag and have the staff work on through this budget process on behalf of all of you. So, Dave, I'll turn it right over to you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'm assuming I'll get a thumbs up from somebody. Um, anyhow, for those of you that have attended the legislative conference, uh, we always do a state budget review presentation, and this is basically the, the same presentation. It, it does last 45 minutes to an hour uh, to go through the information in the slide. So we'll talk a little bit about the economic backdrop, um, national and state. Um, and just up front, you know, we've really, things have really changed in a year. Um, and we've rolled that into the presentation here a little bit to talk about where we were last year and where we are today. Um, so we'll go through the economic picture. We'll talk about the budget gaps, um, how they're being filled um, for the current year and for next year. And also, of course, you know, why it matters to counties and the impact on counties from this budget proposal. Next. So this slide talks about where we were last year and what a difference a year makes. That, that sentence in the, the box on the right there, the December 19th marked the 126th month of the current U.S. economic expansion, officially the longest U.S. expansion on record. That was the first sentence uh, in the state financial plan in their book after the executive summary. So the economy was red hot. It was doing well. Um, it was the longest expansion in New York State history, in addition to being the longest expansion in U.S. history up to that point. And it lasted two more months. It went to, through January and February, as the slide here shows. So it lasted 128 months. And that chart there on the left shows how long different expansions have been in the past. The orange dots in that chart shows what the annual re real GDP growth was during those expansions. You'll notice that expansion from 2009 to 2020 had the lowest GDP growth of any expansion um, that they recorded that are like the top expansions. So it was a slow rollout. Um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about, you know, why was it so such a slow rollout? Why did it take such a long time to come back up? You know, one of the issues, it's not the only issue, but one of the core issues some economists have noted is that state and local governments really had a hard time recovering from the Great Recession. They pulled back on spending and they pulled back on hiring, um, and it really did impact the GDP. You know, government does contribute to GDP and its spending. There's a lot of contracts, a lot of private enterprise that um, produces a lot for government. And because of um, a smaller amount of federal assistance for state and local governments and the deep trough it left, um, to revenues for state and local government. There, that was a contributing factor to the slow growth. So next slide, please. And this is the chart you see in the current year budget book. And you can see what happened there. Uh, the expansion ended March 2020 at 128 months, uh, you know, just after the governor's budget was introduced. And you can see the result of the amount of money in the GDP, what happened. We see a partial V recovery there uh, quickly, but it's really started to stall out towards the end of the year. There's a dramatic drop 
Um, nothing we've seen before. Uh, next slide. And it was, it was what we experienced whiplash at the US economy. It was very difficult. In the second quarter, real GDP fell by 31%, the largest on record. In the third quarter, it rose by 33%, the largest on record. And you can see in the chart on the right, um, you know, the different contributing components of the economy that led to the decline and also led to uh, the recovery in, in some way. Consumption, the red circle there at the bottom is that's the key. It's the consumer. You know, what is what is consumer the consumer contributing? And clearly in the second quarter, um, you know, people were uncertain. We didn't know how long this was going to last. Uh, we're still dealing with it a year later, and it's worse now than it was before in the, in the cost of human life. Um, but then it did recover quickly in in quarter three of the year. And a lot of that had to do with um, federal contributions that helped bolster the consumer as we move through the process. Next. And as I mentioned, we talk about the importance of federal stimulus to consumption. You know, millions of people, tens of millions of people lost their jobs in March and April. The, a lot of the people in the service industry especially but it was pretty across the board early on because everybody shut everything down. Uh, certain states were impacted more deeply. New York, of course, was the epicenter at the beginning of the, the crisis. Um, but what we highlight in this chart here, the, the red circle there to the right, um, just above 2020, that gold bar there, personal income. That's, and you can see the wage and salary drop off was dramatic. Uh, in that quarter. The gold bar though, that is all the federal assistance that came through for individuals. That included unemployment assistance. It included the economic impact checks, $1,200 checks, or um, I forget how much they were exactly, but um, that's what that gold bar represents. And that has helped what helped keep the economy moving because people could still pay their bills. They could put food on the table. They could purchase things they needed because that money was available for those people that were laid off or their hours were cut. Um, so that was a hugely beneficial thing to keep the economy afloat. Uh, back in 2008, you see those two bars dipping downward, the negative on the wage and salary and personal income. There was assistance that came from the federal government, but it was not nearly as large as what we did in this during the pandemic here in the March, April period in those first couple of COVID bills that passed, there was a dramatic, dramatically much more uh, federal assistance provided uh, early on in this pandemic, which really saved the economy to some degree. Uh, there's pockets of the economy that are still struggling and are going to continue to struggle until all the vaccines that um, can be produced are administered, uh, but it is looking better but this federal assistance was key. Next. So on the on the left, we have the, the DOB projections of what they thought the US economy was gonna look like um, last year. So it's pretty steady growth, around 2%, dropping off through the years. And then this year, clearly it's a different picture. Um, you know, 19 didn't change clearly, but 2020, instead of 2% growth, we are looking at a 3.4% drop in GDP. Um, 2021 and 2022 numbers are higher, but when you're coming off that drop um, over the full term, the four years, uh, we're not doing as well as we would have been, even if even with the slower growth projected earlier because we had that huge dip in 2020. Next. Again, uh, you know, people's employment is a key issue for consumption. People that don't have jobs or their hours have been cut back dramatically, they can't spend money like they used to. So last year, um, you know, the underlying part there, unemployment rates are expected to rise slightly, but stay near 50-year lows, uh, according to budget estimates. And this year, the pandemic has caused long-term damage to labor markets and will be a major obstacle to a balanced recovery. Um, National employment is not expected to recover until 2023. We'll talk a little bit more later about the state's projections for New York State, um, but New York State, I'll tell you now, is now projecting 
the employment or the labor market to recover in New York State until 2025. Next. Again, here is just some graphics showing uh, where we are with uh, employment right now, a huge drop there in 2020, um, biggest drop in unemployment. Um, we're still suffering from it today. The, the, the initial jobs report from January 16th, uh, just last week, 900,000 people filed initial claims for unemployment. The same week last year, it was about 200,000 people and had been running at about 200,000 people per week for for many, many months um, in the normal expansion uh, period that we're looking at. Next. Oh, I, I did want to say, too, that most of these charts are pulled directly out of the state financial plan. If I, I don't have a proper sourcing here, just um, this one is a little different. It's from the um, federal government. But this is a reminder of where we are in the pandemic. There's a lot of different types of unemployment assistance that's being provided right now. And this chart just trying shows it. The regular state at the top of that chart there, the regular state in insurance, unemployment insurance, is about 5.7 million people in January, on January 2nd, were collecting um, some sort of assistance. But as you go down the chart, there's all these other types of unemployment that are being paid out. And you'll see we have 16 million people still unemployed or collecting some sort of assistance um, today. That's about 10% of the national workforce is still collecting some sort of assistance from the federal government because their hours have been cut um, or they've lost their jobs. And the, the two biggest ones there, um, the pandemic unemployment assistance. This is a new category created um, for people that are not paying into the insurance system. They're self-employed, they're contract employees, and so forth, and they created a special assistance package for them. Um, 16 million today. Um, in May, 31 million Americans uh, were unemployed. It's 20% of the labor force uh, at that time is recorded as collecting some sort of assistance. So clearly you can see how that can impact consumption, but with the additional unemployment insurance add-ons and the stimulus payments, uh, there was an ability for people to maintain their consumption. Next. Again, this shows by category of work, um, what happened to um, employment. And clearly, as we've seen here in New York and nationwide, the services sector um, are really getting hit very hard. Um, that bar there at the bottom for leisure, hospitality, and other services, you can see employment loss um, in 2020 compared to 2019 in excess of 15%. But every category, except for one, um, is negative. There were job losses in every category across the board um, year over year. Next. Housing has been a bit of a bright spot. Um, another major contributor to the economy, the construction, they're good paying jobs. Um, you know, we have the fortune of low interest rates now, um, and also we have a low supply of homes. So homes are moving quickly, uh, rising home values. Uh, and single family starts, this is nationwide, we're still talking about the U.S. economy here, are the highest since 2007, and that was as of November 2020 that we hit that um, single family starts uh, picture. It's a little different in New York, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But housing is a big contributor to the economy and consumption uh, across the board. Next. So now we're gonna focus a little bit more on the New York State economy. They, they don't have um, uh, the same ability to produce data, um, GDP as a timely as the federal government does. But you can see in this chart on the far right, it shows that cliff and that drop off. And that's kind of what happened. The, the blue line is New York State and the gold line is the, the US average there. So uh, in March of 2020, uh, as with the federal, uh, the US economy, um, the longest expansion in history uh, ended. Next. And here in New York State, uh, this is the unemployment picture. Uh, again, 
The blue in this graph, the light blue, shows the regular unemployment insurance category. The gold shows the people collecting pandemic unemployment assistance. Those are the some of the gig workers and the self-employed um, that are still on assistance. And then there's other categories of assistance that are in there. So we still have close to uh, two and a half million New Yorkers on some sort of assistance um, as of the close of the um, 2020. Um, we did, as we mentioned earlier, you know, New York was first um, to experience uh, the, the tip of the spear of the pandemic. Uh, employment fell very quickly and much deeper, um, and it's expected to take a much longer period of time for uh, our economy compared to other states to climb out of uh, where we are. Next. Again, here talking about this is the New York State picture uh, compared to the U.S. job losses. Uh, and how much has been recovered, um, especially early on, the first couple of months after that, each one of those bar colors on the on the bar chart uh, represents a different month. Uh, gold or the yellow at the bottom, that's May. And then as you go up each month, those are the types of jobs that were recovered. Um, on, the, on the left is the US and you can see in the first three months after the quick drop off, 42% of the jobs are recovered and they're, now, as of the end of December, we're probably a little bit over 50% nationally of jobs recovered. And you can see on the right how the job recovery was much slower in New York, especially in the early month, which makes sense because we were deeper into the pandemic than other states. They hadn't experienced um, the large number of cases, but we're still below, far below the national average. And if you were to put New York City next to these two columns, you would see an even slower job recovery rate uh, because they have been the epicenter and they have a much, uh, they're much more reliant on the services sector uh, in their economy. Next. Again, this is the point we made earlier. The US economy is expected to recover its jobs by 2023. Um, New York, 2025. Next, and this is we talked about it before. The services sector, you know, ten has been hit the hardest. Um, you know, the person, the person contact in the job, the restaurants, hospitality, um, retail trade, uh, those types of jobs were hit the hardest. And what this shows here, the 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 pie, pie chart on the left um, shows the mix of jobs. Um, by wage. Um, so half the jobs were medium wage, about 28% were low wage, 22% are high wage jobs. That's before the pandemic. The pie chart on the right, the March-April losses shows where the job losses occurred based on wage. And you can see that more than half of all the job losses were in the low wage category. Um, so that, and not, as, not nearly as much in the high wage category. This is a pretty big reversal from what happened during the Great Recession. There were actually a lot more job losses on the high end of the market because it, it really hit some of the high end sector jobs uh, quite hard because it was a credit and financial crisis. So a lot of banks were having difficulty and a lot of those high paying jobs went out. This time it's a little bit of a reversal. So between the federal assistance that was provided to the low wage workers who lost their jobs or lost uh, income, and the fact that not as many high wage workers lost their job, that also helped to, to bolster consumption. Um, but this is a, the category we're trying to focus on. There's actually some programs the governor has proposed in his budget to target uh, the low end uh, jobs and also the sectors that were hit the hardest. But next please. Here in New York State, again, this is a similar to the to the bar graph that we showed for the national economy. This um, in this particular one, we're comparing 2020 and 2020, 2021 jobs. And as you can see, the job losses, leisure, hospitality, and other services in 2020 are approaching 30%, uh, almost twice the national average. Um, and then they're still showing where we're gonna expect to be in 20 at the end of 2021. So just about everybody's still gonna be negative, um, even after 2021 in New York, for as far as um, job recovery. Uh, and it's very, in addition to 
individual sectors being impacted differently. The job losses are very unevenly spread across the state. You know, some regions of the state are doing much better. They have a very different mix of um, jobs. Uh, upstate um, tends to have more government sector related jobs as a key employer. And you'll see on the chart on the left that um, that hasn't been as deeply impacted uh, as far as job losses go. Whereas New York City has a low reliance on government jobs, but a higher reliance on leisure, hospitality, and, and some of the management administrative support services. So they're feeling it much more deeply um, than parts of upstate are. Next. And these are the unemployment rates to, to highlight what I was mentioning about how it's spread differently across the state uh, and how we compare against the country on December of 2020. The unemployment rate nationally at 6.7 was almost was is more than was almost double of where it was in December 2019, and you can see for New York State at 8.2 percent, we're more than double where we were in 2019, and New York City's triple uh, practically um, compared to where they were in 2019 as far as their unemployment rate goes. And you can see outside of New York City, um, much better employment picture. It's not where we really want to be, um, but it, it's improving. Uh, it's important to note, too, that nationally in December, uh, we actually recorded job losses overall, about 140,000. So that's the part of the reason why we're seeing no change from November, December nationally, but there was an uptick actually in New York and some parts of the state uh, because of job losses instead of job um, new jobs being created. Next. So in addition to employment, wages and wage growth are, and personal income are, are very important um, to making sure we can continue to bolster consumption and have people feel comfortable about um, going out uh, and spending some resources um, of their, their personal income. Um, so as we recover these jobs, that's going to help the economy. As wage growth strengthens, that's going to help the economy. And any additional support to personal income beyond wages uh, can also boost the economy. And when I talk about beyond wages, that gets into, you know, at the high end of the market um, for the, the, you know, the top 5%, top 10%. You know, the stock market has been awesome over the last nine months. It's created a lot of wealth. Um, for that end. So there's money in the economy related to that. There was the federal assistance for people in the middle and the lower end. Um, that Much of that assistance is falling out of the picture, although we did have that bill passed in uh, December that did provide uh, one-time checks again. So here, financial sector has been leading the way in wages, um, followed by government, uh, professional and scientific services, health and social service categories. Um, and clearly, as we talked about, unique to 2020 was the impact of the federal payments that um, helped bolster personal income. Next. This is a breakdown of New York State uh, of where um, the employment is and the amount of wages earned by sector. And that big tall bars in the middle there, that's finance and insurance. Um, it's actually declined over time. Uh, that Even though we're at record levels in the stock market, the amount of wages paid in the industry has fallen. And that has more to do with um, the Frank Dodd reforms in the banking system and the financial services system after the Great Recession. Um, the way the industry pays its employees changed quite a bit. Um, so that's part of the drop as overall wages of New York State. It's still dramatic though, 18% uh, in 2020 of all wages earned in the state are in that industry, finance and insurance. And you'll see government is second behind that. And upstate, as I had mentioned earlier, um, government is often the single largest employer in the county when you consider, especially if you have um, a SUNY, a SUNY system uh, school uh, combined with the local governments and the county government, um, it becomes a large employer in those areas and 
can be a little bit more stable at times, uh, depending on the type of recession we're experiencing. Next. And this is a, a chart that was in the, the governor's budget that breaks down the federal assistance that came into the state of New York from the various COVID bills. And it breaks it down by category. Uh, and it tells you how much it impacted um, personal income in the second quarter of 2020 and the, se and the third quarter of 2020. And it's really amazing. It's $180 billion uh, came into the state in the second quarter from all of these different sources. Um, the PPP loans that came in, uh, uh, food assistance programs, um, other income that was provided, unemployment insurance, uh, the basic checks, the other transfers down at the bottom, the economic impact payments, um, even the uh, funding that went to um, the medical sector. Um, a lot of money was pumped in from the federal government there as well. Uh, $22 billion down, down there at the, in that just in the second quarter. Um, DOB is projecting that the Emergency Coronavirus Act that passed in December, uh, which has the $600 payments in it, and it has the extension of unemployment insurance and some other programs, will add about $81 billion in transfer income, which is basically the, the, the unemployment insurance and the one-time checks. Uh, that is part of, uh, it's incorporated into the state's financial plan. They're assuming that $81 billion is going to be there and available in that first quarter, which uh, should be helpful um, for consumption and for the consumer and for small businesses and large businesses that are, uh, rely on them. Next. And we only have one slide in housing here for New York. I mean, again, a, a big contributor to uh, consumption and economic development and um, the uh, GDP in the state. It's pretty strong in New York as well. Uh, over the first nine months, uh, this chart, basically this graphic shows price appreciation. Um, we're not as strong as the rest of the country um, on average, but the market is, looks pretty good. Um, we are benefiting from similar things that the national housing market is benefiting from with the low interest rates. Um, and there's a shortage of housing stock in certain parts of the state. So they're seeing a, a bigger growth um, than other places. This same chart from 2019, the graphic would look much more like a checkerboard. It was very uneven growth, counties next door to each other, very different results. You can see the solid blue here, the solid five to 8% growth in housing prices, very consistent across much of the state in the first nine months of 2020. Last year, it did not look like that. It was all over the place. Um, even if they, they, they still use the same four categories, either you're falling or you're up to 5%, up to 8% or over 8% growth. They use the same categories, but it was it looked like a checkerboard. Uh, from 2019. So we've got a very consistent pattern here in housing, and hopefully that will continue um, heading into next year because that, that's a big driver, um, good paying jobs. Uh, one of the benefits of the construction work too is, you know, social distancing is uh, pretty easily accommodated uh, and people are outside as they're building the structures. So there's not the limitations uh, in that field. So that that is beneficial as well. Next. So now we're going to talk a little bit about that provides a backdrop of where the economy is and its ability to produce revenues for the state. Um, and as we said before, we we were hit harder and deeper uh, compared to many other states. But we've seen some positive results. We saw that sharp V, uh, which is petering out as far as the recovery goes a little bit. Um, but part of that sharp rebound has provided more revenues to the state. So for 2021, we were looking at an almost $9 billion deficit um, at the six month budget review uh, in the state financial plan. It was, we we're just still expecting a $9 billion shortfall. That has since dropped to about 5 billion. Uh, and most of that um, was related to higher revenue uh, related to personal income tax uh, is a drop off there. So how is the state closing the current year gap? They want to get a clean slate. 
they're closing out this year and they want to start concentrating on next year. So the plan for closing out this year is um, there's still going to be a 5% across the board cut local assistance. Um, right now, the state has been withholding up to 20% um, in many programs for counties and other local governments and others who receive aid locally, um, whether they're private not-for-profits uh, or other entities. Uh, there's been a lot of withholding across the board. Um, so 5%, while it's still a cut, is a lot better than 20%. Um, the Division of Budget has indicated that sometime within the first quarter, calendar quarter of 2021, they will release back that 15% extra that's been held. So that should be welcome for counties as you work towards closing your books for 2020 and trying to figure out um, where you want to put that money. Do you want to put it into 2020 or 2021? Um, that's something you need to work with your auditors on. Um, so there's that. There's a lot of cash reestimates uh, and some targeted cu uh, spending cuts to make up part of the um, difference for closing 2021 gap. Uh, there's a, over a billion dollars in Medicaid uh, changes, um, cuts in reimbursement, um, for managed care, long-term plans. Um, a lot of, um, especially on the Medicaid side, there was a lot less um, utilization uh, during the pandemic. Um, people didn't do regular doctor visits like they were. There was some hesitancy. There was difficulty making appointments. Uh, I know personally I made appointments that the morning of my scheduled appointment, I was called because someone in the doctor's office had COVID and they had to close down for the day. Um, so there was a lot of that going on. So there was a lot less utilization, so a lot less spending. So that helped uh, the state get through um, the budget shortfall for 2021. Additionally, there's a little over $500 million in portfolio debt management that they're taking advantage of with the low rates. Um, the CRF funding is, there's two and a half billion they're using. They're basically supplanting federal money that the state received through uh, the COVID stimulus bills early on. Uh, the state did receive 5.2 billion. Two and a half billion is being used to close out the 2021 state fiscal year, most of that two and a half billion was used to pay salaries that were budgeted in the financial plan, but now they're using a federal dollar to pay for it. Uh, and then there was an additional 500 million enhanced Medicaid match, which we'll talk about more later because we share in that, but the state use um, additional enhanced FMAP from the COVID relief bill. Uh, each quarter, uh, many of you are aware of this, but each quarter, where the public health emergency at the national level is in effect. Um, another quarter of enhanced FMAP is earned um, and is released uh, to the state. Um, and then the state over some period of time hands that down to the counties. And we'll talk more about that later. Next. Now for 2022. So again, because the revenues came in stronger, um, the, the the out-year gap got smaller. So we were looking at a nearly $17 billion gap in the six-month review point for 2022, and now it's down to $10 billion. So there's a there's a smaller gap uh, to deal with. And as I mentioned, uh, most of the reduction is due to higher than forecast income taxes, um, about $8.2 billion over two years. So it's significant. Um, it was about three billion in 2021 and five to six billion in that range over 2022 is what they're expecting in higher income taxes over their lower forecasted amount. And that's important to highlight here. Uh, we do in the the second sub bullet there. Revenues are projected to be about 40 billion lower over four years versus what was projected pre-pandemic. So that's kind of the loss the governor has highlighted. I, I've noticed in a couple of his uh, briefings, uh, he targets that 40 billion in lost revenue, and he thinks it's fair that we got 15 billion back from the federal government to make up for that revenue hole. We're not asking for a complete refill. Um, he's asking for you know a portion of it back, uh, about 30%, uh, to help us get through. Uh, but it was a huge blow. I, that, uh, as the economy shut down and took time to recover, and is still, we're a long way from a full recovery, uh, it really does impact revenues, uh, it, especially in certain sectors um, of our economy. 
So there's the governor built his budget around two primary contingencies regarding the receipt of federal assistance. He's counting on some level of federal assistance, uh, six billion over two years or 15 billion over two years. Next. So under the the budget submitted largely is mirrored upon or built upon the assumption of six billion dollars in federal aid as something to help fill the gap. Um, and that he's counting on three billion in 22 and another three billion in federal assistance to 2023 to offset gaps. So our starting point is the governor plans on continuing the five percent cut in aid to localities across the board. Um, I say across the board, but it's truly not across the board. You know, some programs are eliminated completely. Um, other areas you'll see level funding, uh, especially in the public health area, you'll see a lot of level funding, and then you'll see a huge cut in a different or complete elimination of another public health program. That's happening across the state budget, but the goal is for them to get 5% out of aid to localities to help uh, fill their hole. Um, so these spending cuts amount to about 3.6 billion in total. Um, there's a, a $1.7 billion negative adjustment for school aid. Having said that, there's a considerable amount of uh, K-12 education assistance and higher ed money that was adopted as part of the December COVID package that Congress passed. So no school district's gonna see a reduction in their state aid, um, but there is something that they're holding back in this negative adjustment. Uh, which would probably be restored if more than six billion comes in, and we'll talk about the reductions. But there's about 600 million in Medicaid cuts. Um, most of this is targeted towards um, provider reimbursements. There's uh, proposals for a one percent across the board cut. Some again utilization reductions. So some of the managed care companies are seeing cuts um, because the utilization was lower. Um, there's also some some moving cash from year to year in Medicaid from the fiscal plan, um, mainly in uh, pool provider payments they pay, and they're cutting back on a lot of um, um, indigent care pools, and I will talk about that in a few minutes as well too. But there's there's significant cuts there. Um, state agency cuts, debt cap, debt and capital project savings again. There is a tax increase. They hope to get $2 billion uh, in new revenues. Um, this is a temporary, it would last about two years, but there's always a tail because the state fiscal year does not match the calendar year for tax purposes, for federal tax purposes. So the, the, the two year temporary increase would generate revenue for three years. Um, in the financial plan, that there it would be 1.5 billion annually, about. Um, and then they also would delay the middle class income tax cut that's currently scheduled that would save about 400 million. Next. And then there's federal aid that would close out the, uh, the big chunk of the budget. There's the 3 billion in unrestricted aid we talked about. Um, there's 1 billion from enhanced COVID F map. That's the, um, actually I, that number's wrong there. It's 6.2%. Um, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but the budget assumes these enhanced uh, COVID FMAP funds will last through June of 2021. Um, these savings, of course, are non-recurring, so this billion dollars is not available in the out years, and we'll show in some of the charts in a few minutes. Um, there are continued gaps in the financial plan in the out years because a lot of this money is one time. And same with the FEMA, there's $600 million in additional FEMA funds. Um, there's also 200 million in 23 and 200 million in 24 of FEMA money, money they're counting on to fill the gap, uh, but then it disappears uh, after that. Next. So under the $15 billion contingency, there's some line items in the budget. Um, they have very large appropriation authorizations in the budget in case federal money comes in. There's close to $40 billion uh, across multiple uh, authorizations within the budget if the money comes in. Uh, most of that money is not related to unrestricted aid. A lot of it's related to unemployment insurance uh, and other things that the state has to accept the money to pass it through. 
uh, for program purposes. So there are these categories, but the budget does specifically line out um, if this extra, if we do get the $15 billion help that they would buy back about 5.2 billion in local assistance category cuts. And, it, and this lists out where they are. It doesn't say exactly what would happen, but it's sort of a blueprint. I'm sure this would be negotiated with the legislature on how they would do this, but um, about 1.6 billion directly for school districts, another 1.6 billion for the state education department, but a lot of that's related to uh, grant money that goes out to school districts. Um, $600 million um, for operating expenses, which for departments and personnel service contracts. $400 million for the Department of Health. Um, this would include municipalities and other public health organizations where funding could be restored. $700 million uh, for social service programs, a couple hundred million for transit, and $100 million for payments to local governments. Uh, I think a lot of that $100 million is probably related to some of the direct program cuts um, like AIM and other things they did, as well as part of the 5% uh, that is occurring um, across the board. Next. And this is the gap closing, uh, just to show us the chart in each year, what's the value of each cut. And as you can see at the bottom, we're highlighting, uh, even with all these actions they're taking, these federal funds, the raising of taxes temporarily, uh, the debt service things they're doing, the Medicaid reforms they're doing, uh, you have out your gaps growing, uh, mainly because a lot of these cuts and savings are non-recurring. Um, which creates a problem is next year we're going to be in the same boat of looking at cuts. Um, if the 15 billion came in, I'm sure those out year gaps would look different. This is built off of the six billion dollar model um, of federal assistance over two years. And that's the unrestricted federal aid is there at the bottom where you have the three billion and the three billion and 22 and 23. Um, so clearly, if something more than $6 billion comes in, um, those out-year gaps are probably going to look a lot different, as well as the spending cuts and tax hikes that they're doing to close the gap. Those are all going to be negotiated with the legislature on how do we use that federal money to get through where we are today and build our budgets in the out years. Next. Now there is language in the budget again, uh, as in this year, the governor had authority to withhold funds if the budget was deemed out of balance um, at any point during the year. And that's why he's been holding back to 20%. That language has continued in the, the this budget, uh, in the appropriation bills. There's, there's some different definitions. So um, last time it was just, if we were out of balance by 1% at any given point, and there was three measurement points, the governor would hold funding. This year, they def they defined unbalanced as as of August 31st, 2021, the state received less than three billion in unrestricted federal aid. That's the definition of, of unbalanced. So any additional withholding uh, beyond the five percent would not occur until that date if nothing has happened. So we're hoping Congress acts sooner so we don't have to deal with this. Um, potential threshold, but right now, the the budget's built on that 5% across the board cut. If we get 3 billion, if nothing happens, then that 5% is gonna have to be bigger or tax cuts are gonna have to change or, or, or tax increases may have to change. Some sort of balance is gonna have to be achieved by the legislature um, if we do not get any additional federal assistance. So it, there's the similar categories of where the 5% across the board would not apply. The first four are the same as they were last year, public assistance payments to families and individuals, any reductions that violate federal law, constitutionally required payments, debt service, for example. Uh, the new one that's added is payments for school aid. Um, and then the other one that existed last year is um, uh, court orders and judgments. Uh, and from our viewpoint, we think that the Harrell Herring settlement cannot be cut because it's a court order, it's a judgment, it's a settlement. Um, there is another provision in the budget too and related to police reform that a lot of you are working on now. You do have to submit a certification to the state uh, by a um, certain date. 
if that certification is not sent in, the budget provides authority to the governor uh, and the budget director to withhold funding. Next. Now, as, as County Executive Molinero pointed out and, and Steve pointed out front and what we've been hearing and what we've been working on all of us so hard for a year now is this budget again is balanced in some way on unrestricted federal aid coming in. Um, this, the, the bill that passed in December took seven months to, to get where it was and uh, state and local assistance was not part of it. Um, we do have a different president, we do have a different Senate, as Steve pointed out, but the margins are so slim in both chambers, they can't lose any of their own um, if they want to uh, get a bill passed uh, using majority votes only. Um, and a lot of you know this, but you know, it's a key issue here is how the US Senate works. You know, any bill must have 60 votes uh, before it can even be considered in the chamber. So that's, you know, it provides some veto authority in a way for the minority party in the Senate, but that's, you know, the way it was designed by our founders. Um, so that is a hurdle. Uh, and right now, it just does not appear that they can get 60 votes um, right now on the President Biden's $1.9 trillion package, which includes uh, $350 billion in state and local aid. Next. So what I would call, I just want to spend a moment on budget reconciliation because that we, we see that word and we hear people talking about using budget reconciliation um, to, to force a bill through. Um, it, it makes the rules in the Senate and in the House a little easier to move a, 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 a package of bills through. There are a lot of rules. Uh, around uh, using budget reconciliation and each house, each chamber adopts their own rules in the budget reconciliation process. So something that might fly in the house won't fly in the Senate. Um, and it's usually the Senate and the Senate parliamentarian that makes a decision on what ultimately gets included under the Senate budget rules under budget reconciliation that can stay in. Um, so just a little history on this. this. This is a new procedure. It's an alternative procedure for moving legislation. It was adopted in 1974. It's only been used 25 times since 1974. So it's not a procedure that they use a lot. Um, but when it's a major package and they know it's going to be difficult or it's a complex um, series or pieces of legislation that are necessary to achieve the outcome, uh, they use this measure and, and the, the biggest benefit is it only requires um, a simple majority vote in the Senate to pass. So that's a big key. And this is, there's some averages here of the 25 bills, um, four were vetoed. So you clearly had a different um, president, par a party in the White House versus where it was in Congress, probably in those four vetoes. Um, that would be the result there. Um, but on average, budget reconciliation takes about five months to move the bill through the process. And that's largely due to the complexity of these types of proposals. Budget reconciliation was originally intended. The whole reason it was adopted in the 1970s was they created a regular budget process. And the goal was um, to reduce the federal deficit. And it was always hard to get people to vote on cutting spending or to lower the deficit. So they created this procedure to make it a little bit easier to reduce uh, the federal deficit. Um, but what usually happens is it's a multi-step process. The budget committee has to pass a resolution. A resolution is not binding in law. It doesn't go to the president. It doesn't have to be signed. It's just a blueprint. But that blueprint provides instructions to every congressional committee on how they're, what they're supposed to do to achieve the savings to reduce the deficit. Um, as I said, each chamber has their own rules. Next. Um, and just w one last thing on reconciliation is in the current situation, if they use reconciliation to do the COVID package, 
um, this emergency package, the president's package that's on the table now, they could accelerate the time frame quite a bit. And, and the main reason is, is the House has already written this bill basically and passed it. So the bill text is available, the committees have already done their work. So in theory, if they can keep everybody together, um, they could move this through the process a lot quicker uh, than the five month average. But that, as we said, and as uh, Mark and Steve highlighted up front, there's you can't lose one person uh, in the Senate uh, or the package can't pass. So um, it is still an uphill climb, but reconciliation provides a, an opportunity that uh, didn't exist in the last Congress uh, or with the last White House. So in the budget bill, there are some issues and related to taxation of finance that will directly impact counties. And some of these things we've been advocating for for years, um, as County Executive Molinaro pointed out, we did, we've been talking with DOB uh, since August and even earlier, the, the county execs, as they were implementing and all county officials were implementing uh, the COVID requirements, there was a lot of discussion uh, with the governor's office, the second floor and the division of budget. But we really started the budget process a lot earlier. Um, to lay the groundwork and to talk about things that would be helpful for us that don't necessarily cost the state uh, any money. So on the taxation side, the, the budget would grant permanent local sales tax authority to counties at your existing rate or up to 4%. So if you're one of the few counties below 4%, you would be able to go up to 4% without uh, a state bill uh, passage. You could do it locally. Uh, the, the budget requires that you would still have to pass a local law or resolution to continue uh, your sales tax authority at whatever rate you're at, as long as it was an existing rate or it's not above 4%. Uh, and the bill calls to do it in odd years beginning in 2023. And it does not impact current sales tax sharing arrangements. Uh, I know we did have a question about whether we would still need to file sales tax sharing arrangements with uh, the comptroller. We we're looking into that, but from the division of budgets perspective, uh, what they're proposing here does not do anything with sales tax sharing uh, local arrangements at all. Um, the bill does, as Steve mentioned, established um, uh, the requirement that uh, marketplace providers that facilitate um, Vacation rentals, this would be your Airbnb, uh, the Verbo, I used to call it VRBO, but it's Verbo on the new commercials I see on TV. Any entity that does that, this is much like an Amazon of the world who is required to collect sales tax on products they sell, um, even if it's not their own product, where they're acting as the intermediary. This would be a similar approach, uh, and this would be statewide. Um, the bill also provides, this is something we had advocated for, uh, if recreation adult use marijuana uh, comes to pass, that we would, we think we should be applying local sales tax at the point of sale on those, on those um, transactions. And the budget does call for that, uh, in addition to some other uh, taxes, and we'll talk about the, that particular item. But from a taxation perspective, uh, local sales tax would be applied at the point of sale. Um, and as County Executive Molinaro had mentioned, you know, the diversion of local sales tax to pay for fiscally stressed health facilities, that's $250 million per year. Um, that is still in the budget and moving forward. It does have a two-year sunset, so it would, there's a 2022 or 2021 and 2022 would be the two years. Um, this gets a little complicated. Uh, the $250 million for the state fiscal year ending March 31st, 2021, all of that funding is being taken out of your February 4th sales tax check that is yet to come. So that number is gonna look very different for a lot of you compared to your number for February 4th for the first payment of February of 2020. Um, and that's because they're taking out all of this funding. It's 50 million from the counties, 200 million from New York City. And then quarterly going forward in for the state fiscal year 2022 budget um, that starts April 1st, they take out um, 
the 250 million in four quarterly installments, the last being in January of 2022. Uh, so that's still on the table. You know, we've made a pretty strong argument to the executive um, about there's a lot of federal assistance um, that's been authorized. $178 billion has been authorized from the federal government to help the healthcare system deal with COVID. Um, facilities in New York have received $11.5 billion already. Um, Senator Schumer and Senator Gillibrand said in a press release that through the first two quarters of 2020, 87% of um, all health facility revenue in the state has been restored um, from these payments. Uh, and there's still 40, there's still 70 billion in funding that needs to be distributed to the healthcare system. So it's been part of our argument about, you know, putting this off, this diversion off um, until all of the federal funding is dispersed out uh, for that system. Next. Oh, and there's another thing in the package. We, we've been asking for this um, to basically what this does is allow local governments to expand the types of investment opportunities they can use for their cash. Uh, right now, we have very narrow opportunities to invest our cash. Um, recently, New York City was provided some uh, enhanced authority. In general, they have enhanced authority compared to, to counties to invest their money. But basically what they've offered New York City, they're gonna to offer to counties and other local governments. And this kind of lists them out. You would be able to invest in the general obligation bonds of any state other than New York. Um, there are requirements that would have to be um, a highest rated by at least one of the independent rating agencies. Obligations of a corporation organized under the laws of any state. Uh, you would need uh, a highest rated from two independent rating agencies to for that. Um, obligation to be qualified. And there are limitations in some of these. Um, you could have no more than 250 million invested in any one corporation. And also below where there's expanded list of obligations um, for any federal agency or instrument in the US, there's also a $250 million limit per agency. So no, mo no load money market mutual funds. This could be very helpful. I mean, the rates of return are so low in the market right now on the limited package of um, investments we have and um, you know if you're if you're watching your liquidity and have a liquidity plan in place um, this could be very helpful to have these additional opportunities you could can significantly increase your um, interest income um, with these new options that's something we had asked for with the division of budget and I, this is one of the ones where they said yeah this makes sense right away so um, they did put it in there Next. So now we're gonna go through the different categories um, in the budget, um, mainly by functional area, but we did wanna highlight AIM here. Again, this um, it gets a little complicated to explain, uh, but basically last year um, or two years ago, the state uh, eliminated direct AIM payments from the state to most towns and villages and basically required counties to support that funding um, by committing a certain portion of local sales tax. Uh, the counties don't make the direct payments, but the sales tax, 59 million was diverted uh, to the state. And then the state turned around and made these AIM related payments as they call them to the towns and villages. So now the governor is going the next step and he's reforming what's left of AIM, where the state is making direct payments. So the biggest recipients of AIM, more than 95% of the money really goes to cities today, especially with the towns and villages um, being gone uh, from the program. But the goal is to cut AIM by about 5%, um, but it's gonna be very uneven for these cities. So. Um, the cuts are posted online. If you go to uh, the DOB website, they, they do list out the aim and we'll share it uh, with the group. So you can see the cities in your county, how they might be impacted. But if you're not very reliant on aim in your city, you're gonna get a 20% reduction. If you're heavily reliant uh, in some of your bigger upstate cities, almost 20% of their budget comes from aim, they're gonna get a two and a half percent reduction. 
Um, so the city aim portion is going to be reformed um, in the budget process, and it's going to equal out to about a 5% reduction in the process. For the towns and villages that are still getting direct aim payments, they're also going to be transferred to a county responsibility uh, through a, another diversion of county sales tax. Um, but there are some additional steps here. So next, please. So once everybody gets, once all the towns and villages are taken out of their direct AIM program or those that are in the current AIM related program, what the governor does in his budget proposal is cut all of that by 20%. So counties are responsible for 59 million. When you add the new towns and villages to that AIM related package, that's another eight and a half million. So you're gonna be at about $68 million. That's before the 20% reduction. So when they do the 20% reduction across the board for all those entities, um, the AIM related payments for counties, the sales tax diversion would be about 54.2 million, which is a savings of about 5 million. The problem is clearly, um, not all counties are treated the same here because of the mix of towns and villages in your community. So 22 counties would see an increase of about 1.8 million in total from this package, and about 35 counties would see a savings of nearly 7 million um, from this shift and then cut proposal that the governor's put on the table. Next. Now by functional area, there's a, there's a, uh, I'll be able to go through these slides a little quicker. Um, there's a continuation of a lot of programs, but we're just gonna to try to hit some of the highlights. And aging, uh, last year, the governor included 15 million for um, ISIP services. He maintains that funding and he continues to waive the local match um, for the additional aid for this, this portion of the aid. Um, there's cuts in the board, across the board for agriculture, uh, amounts to a reduction of about 12%. Um, not all programs are cut though, as again, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, when they talk about across the board, it's it's at their discretion. So some programs are completely eliminated and others may be level funded. Um, and here we list out, you know, they, they eliminated funding for migrant child care. I believe that was actually a legislative ad. So anywhere in the budget, there was a legislative ad, it was cut out. Uh, that's standard practice of every governor um, in my recent memory. But here they're also showing some other programs they're, they're eliminating. If any of these are really important to you, you, uh, you, should, you know, should work with your um, assembly member or senator to get them restored. They are creating some new programs with the money they're saving here. So like the Taste New York cut there, they are creating something new. Um, I will defer to our ag person if questions come up, but they are creating some new things as they cut things. So, but then again, just to highlight again, some programs are eliminated, others are level funded. Uh, it's it's gonna be hit or miss um, across these different agencies. Next. Community colleges. Um, the per student FTE is the same as last year at 2947, um, but this actually results in $11 million cut, uh, mainly because of student census uh, based on the state. Um, and it's about a two and a half percent cut from about 432 million to about 421. Uh, this is for the, the, the base aid that we talk about with community colleges. Uh, the budget does preserve state financial aid benefits for students um, that through no fault of their own were unable to complete academic requirements uh, to maintain financial aid eligibility because of COVID. Next. Early intervention, this is another area where we propose some pretty significant changes to the, um, the governor and the division of budget, and they accepted some of these, and they came up with some of their own things as well. Um, there were some reforms would save the state about 12, 12 million, uh, and it would save the counties of New York City about $29 million um, if they're adopted. Um, they would continue the current teletherapy rates, but they, um, the process of using teletherapy to deliver services during a pandemic, they wanna continue that for another year, um, potentially make that permanent. 
um, and they would lower the rate um, to 20% less than what is paid for the same therapy in person at a facility. Um, they would align the group development and the EI requirements. It saves a little bit of money. And the, the big ticket item in savings here is they would eliminate consecutive extended sessions. Again, if questions come up, I'll defer to our um, EI expert. Next. Economic development, these are um, things we've seen in the past from the governor that hasn't been adopted. Um, alcohol and movie theaters uh, provide licenses that way. Um, extends prevailing wage to renewable energy projects. Um, there are um, thresholds and limitations here. They have to be a certain size of megawatts and the project has to be a certain size for these prevailing wage requirements to kick in. Um, there's the broadband affordability a proposal the governor talked about, I think, in the back to the state of the state, it would be a subsidized rate of $15 per month. This includes any equipment in that $15 a month. Um, so I think the actual service would be much the service cost when you consider any equipment fees that might be charged on for a modem or something else. Uh, it's a pretty small amount of money um, for the provider to provide the service. Um, they would limit annual increases once every five years uh, to no more than the rate of inflation for that period. Um, and there's no language that restricts providers from charging current customers more to support the subsidized access. Um, the governor did try that um, when he did some reforms to how opioids were um, prescription opioids were sold in the state, he tried to say that he could not limit, um, they could not pass on that cost uh, through their products elsewhere. Um, but I think they, they're not doing it. So, and then other academic programs are continuing. Next. Uh, this is, the governor's created a couple of programs um, to help out. Um, industries hit really hard. Um, so there's a, a restart program for restaurants and small businesses. There's a separate program for New York City, uh, and there's some differences for upstate. Uh, next, please. And there's also a special program targeted for uh, New York City for musical and theater production. It's $25 million and describes the limitations here of the different types of uh, entities that would be eligible. Next. Elections, there's some reforms. Most of these are being moved through the legislature uh, right now. Um, so there's, they would extend some of the voting times, the voting hours, uh, and those are laid out here. Uh, the key here for counties is there's no additional state funding provided for these changes. Next. Environment, it's a kind of a continuation of the current year budget. You know, the governor's fully funding is clean water and environmental protection fund. Um, and it does establish a new process for assessing uh, solar and wind energy systems. Um, and we'll probably have a future discussion on that issue. Um, but it does create requirements for uh, local jurisdictions to enter into a pilot agreement. And there are time limitations in these new proposals. Next. Uh, as I said, not all the boards uh, uh, cuts are even. Um, the, budget proposal to eliminate DLT aid uh, for all municipalities outside Yonkers and list them here. Next. Uh, it does allow the gaming commission to do an RFI for the, the remaining three uh, commercial gaming licenses that are out there. Uh, the budget also proposes to legalize mobile sports betting. Uh, there's no direct involvement of OTVs in this situation. Uh, and it shows the ramp up. This is a, a long tail on getting it up and running, but it's a substantial amount of money. Uh, and the state would retain the vast majority of the revenues and profits from this enterprise. And they would basically run it uh, similar to how they run the, the New York State Lottery, even though they will rely on um, private entities to um, set up the apps and maintain the systems to uh, allow for the mobile sports betting. Next. As I said, um, you know, could the OTBs aren't specifically in the bill, but 
there's no limits on who could submit an application, but really you would have to be an established player in this market to be competitive in submitting a proposal. Next. The biggest problem in the human services area is the 5% across the board. We just, we do so much in social services. Uh, it's a significant funding cut for the state and, or for uh, counties in New York City. It's almost $66 million. The, the budget proposes to close some underutilized state use facilities. They're listed there. Um, and we're also beginning implementation of the Federal Family First Prevention Services Act. There's a lot of requirements under this law. Um, your, your social service departments are going to be very busy working on this implementation. Next. Uh, judgment interest rates is in there. Uh, again, the proposal from prior years that they would lower the judgment interest rate and the Office of uh, Indigent Legal Services is fully funded with an additional $50 million for Harrell Herring. Next. Uh, medical marijuana, um, adult use recreational marijuana, as I had mentioned, there's, um, this is in the proposal. Uh, the key here for us is state and local sales tax uh, would be applied. This is a very long rollout of this. Um, 20 million would might be available in all funds to the state in 2022. They don't expect it to mature until almost 2027 at almost 400 million. They create a lot of different um, pots of money for certain services. Next. Um, and there is a local option. So any county in a city with a population over 100,000 would have a local option to allow uh, cultivation, processing, or distribution. Um, but you must act by December 31st, 2021. There's no opting out after that date. Next. Um, this just lines out some of the Medicaid cuts. Go to the next slide, please. Um, the, well, the point I would like to make here is our federal funds, um, as I had indicated, the governor's including, we're assuming extended uh, or enhanced FMAP through June of 2021. For counties, we share in this. We've only been reimbursed for EFMAP earned through September 30th, 2020, and that is, being seen in our weekly share adjustments through March 31st, 2021. So this means if the budget is correct, there's three additional quarters of EF map that's owed to counties in New York City. We think this is about $500 million and they will likely do this through lowering weekly shares again at some point in the future, uh, hopefully for most of 2021 so we can get maximum benefit out of this. But this is a significant um, benefit. Also for counties that have hospitals or participate in dish payments or IGTs for your nursing homes, the EF map does apply to your non-federal local match, so it will be lower. Um, some of you may have paid this already at a higher rate. Um, DOH is saying you will be getting a refund at some point in the near future on any overpayment you may have made. But during the entire period of enhanced F map, um, during those time periods, you have a lower match um, for FMAP if you're involved in IGTs or dish payments for your facilities. Next. Uh, um, for time purposes, I'm, I'm going to end it here. Um, so you can go through the rest of the slides um, I, on your own, but transportation is level funded. There's some requirements on the personnel side. Um, but we'll have these posted and I'm going to turn it back over to Steve and Jeanette for follow-up or next next points. Okay, David, thank you very much uh, for a comprehensive uh, economic outlook and then the actual county impact. I'm sure you had a lot more to add. Uh, we're grateful that you did the slides. Again, as Jeanette mentioned, we'll post those slides uh, on the NISAC website this afternoon. Uh, so you can download those slides there and further examine them. We have quite a few questions that have come in. If you have a question, please send it into your chat box there on your screen and we'll get to it. But before we do that, why don't we take a, a, a bit of a reaction panel. Uh, Jack Marin, if you're available, we'll go to Jack Marin first, the NISAC president, and then we'll go to John Becker from Madison County, and then Jason Molino from Tompkins County uh, will be speaking in, in the place of Sean Groden. Jack, are you there? 
I am, Steve. Thank you, Steve. And um, Dave, uh, Lucas, thank you. And to the NISAC team for all your efforts here. I do want to thank you as well. You had the uh, County Impact Scorecard come out last week. Uh, yes, it was yes. very uh, nice. We like the uh, the green, the red, uh, thumbs up, thumbs down uh, scenario. Um, so, yes, a couple reactions real quickly here. Uh, I'm in a region that has a, a video lottery. Uh, for Ontario County receives a share. The town next to the town that I'm the supervisor at the town of Farmington reads, uh, receives a significant amount of money. Uh, and again, I know that doesn't, this doesn't impact every county. Uh, so, you know, in, in trying to get uh, support uh, across the state, it may be difficult. This was an area last year of cuts. I know Farmington, uh, they were shorted or received 350,000 less. Uh, they've done some wonderful things with it. And I'm sure we could go around the state to all those uh, various regions and find some wonderful things that those communities did with it. I guess what I would want to focus on is uh, Dave made, did a wonderful job regarding the distressed hospitals. And I'm wondering if that's something we should be continuing to advocating for that one year pause. Uh, uh, you know, I, I received in last week an email, uh, $520,000 will be withheld from Ontario County. And I'm sure there's counties with uh, larger amounts, but regardless of the amount, it's an impact that we don't need certainly in this year. And so uh, again, I guess my point would be that Maybe this across the state, this is, should be something that we should be taking up with our uh, state senators and assembly people as well. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, President Marin. Uh, point well taken, and we will uh, make that a top priority for us. Uh, the distressed hospital diversion of local sales tax. Thank you. Uh, John Becker, are you with us? Yes, Steve, I'm with you. Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Dave, for an excellent presentation, as always. Um, I think my big concern is uh, our out years, 23 and 24 and 25. Um, I'd like to also see, Dave, if we could, uh, the, the projections for the labor market. You said that New York State uh, didn't think we were going to get back up to even until 2025. Um, I'd like to see the different regions, uh, how that works out with the different regions. And um, a little bit more on our court situation. I'm, uh, you know, Madison County, we've saved a, a ton on labor and it's a lot safer for uh, video arraignments. We'd like to see that going on. I don't know if that's in the legislature or in the cards at all uh, in the courts, but uh, that's something we'd like to see, but uh, also going back, uh, you know, projections for 23, 24, and 25 for uh, the state if uh, we don't, uh, you know, we're relying on this federal money right now if we don't get that money. So that's all I have. Hey, Chairman, thank you. Thank we you. Noted, we've made notes on those things. Uh, Dave, did you get a chance to talk about regional jails? Yeah. No, that was towards the end there, but it does, the, the budget does allow for um, shared jails. We're still trying to get the details of what that means. Does it mean co-ownership across counties or just enhanced boarding out? We're trying to get some of the details on that. Right, because a lot of questions that we're taking are, well, we can already board out with a neighboring county, so what's the real difference here? Okay, yeah. uh, let's go to Jason Molino for the last reaction, and then we'll take some of the questions. Thanks, Steve, um, and thank you, Dave. Uh, another great, uh, a great presentation. Uh, I second much of what Jack and, and John had said. Um, big concern is is the definition of what unbalanced means and how it's reliant on federal aid and that uncertainty. Um, that, that's a concern in general, just in how that will impact both now and in the future years. If the balancing the budget with one-time revenues from the feds and and from other elements than, than what's gonna happen afterwards and what are the structural changes that will take place in order to balance the budget in future years. So that's, I think, just an underlying concern. Um, um, the, the concern for us is our community college hit, what's that gonna to mean to them? Um, the election uh, uh, costs, while, while somewhat nagging in terms of these little these little uh, costs, I think over time it's gonna to add to more costs with, with election reform. I will say there's, there's uh, the one other thing I, I, I don't like is that if there is an unbalanced budget, school districts, um, aren't going to share in that pain, which to me says that it's more pain on, on us in terms of withholdings of future revenues that we may have to have from the state if the budget uh, plans don't pan out. Um, on the bright side of things, I would say that 
um, the Airbnb uh, sale, uh, basically be, being able to charge sales tax, a, a community like ours that has a lot of, um, of these types of, of uh, rentals, it's a good thing from our perspective. Um, there wasn't a lot of detail, but I'm hoping there'll be more about jail staffing and that being set locally. I think for us, where we have low jail numbers, uh, is something we will we will welcome. One thing I would like to see, though, is the um, um, the really there really was no real effort in Medicaid reform that kind of fell flat from my perspective last year. There wasn't anything this year, and that kind of feeds into one of the recommendations NISAC had put forward is a kind of a blue ribbon panel um, with some localities to try to talk about reform moving forward. I think that's going to be an important piece when we talk about structural change moving forward. So. Uh, other than that, that's my initial reaction. One thing I did notice that I thought was lacking in the budget presentation is the governor really put no effort uh, in police reform, although he tied a lot of a lot of aid to it. It was a big thing in June with the executive order, but there was nothing put forward in this budget, at least that I can see, that suggests they're making or they're taking actions at the state level to make police and law enforcement reform um, easier, more equitable at the local level. So that's something that uh, that I'd like to see in the future. But that's my initial gut gut reaction to it. Okay, Jason, thanks so much. And you are correct. Uh, the only reference to police reform is the uh, plans need to be submitted by April 1st by the local governments. Over 500 of them need to submit these plans. And there is language in there that would simply intercept state aid if they do not file the plans. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Jason Molino, the Tompkins County Manager, representing the county administrators and managers, John Becker. Madison County Board Chairman representing the chairs of the legislative boards and Jack Marin, the NISAC president from Ontario County. Ryan Gregoire, you see some questions have come in, the NISAC legislative director. Why don't we take some questions? I'm sure some of these would be of interest. Uh, you've got about 15 minutes or so left here. You, maybe you can uh, present these questions to Dave uh, and then and, uh, answer them for the folks that are with us. Sure. Thanks, Stephen. And Good morning, everyone. The first question, Dave, is whether or not there will be a 1% across the board Medicaid cut. A few advocacy groups and providers have said that they have heard the governor say this in the state of the state, but we haven't been able to find that in budget bills. My understanding is yes, there will be a 1% across the board cut for providers. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, will the budget as presented include a 5% reduction as a hard cut to aid to localities or whether this is a similar, if this is similar to the 20% withhold which took place this past year? In other words, what is the likelihood that counties will see a restoration of the 5% decrease in aid to localities if federal funding is received in excess of the governor's plan? Yeah, it's a it's an excellent question because they they actually operationalized the five percent cut differently in the budget bills this year versus last year. Last year it was just language saying the governor can withhold what he needs to withhold to balance the budget. What they did this year on the five percent or the other line item cuts, they actually reduced the appropriation dollar amount line by line. So for a restoration to occur doesn't mean it won't happen, but they have to go back in and rewrite the entire budget line by line um, because they actually did do a hard cut, as you described in your question, because they lowered the individual appropriations out of the gate. Could they be restored later if federal money comes in? The governor said he would, he's willing to do that, uh, but it really depends on how much money is coming in. But right now, I view it as a hard cut. Great. Uh, the next question, Dave, is I recall the 2020-2021 state budget deficit pre-pandemic estimated at $6 billion. As compared to the current year budget gap of $4.8 billion, it appears New York State has benefited from the pandemic. Is this correct? Um, I would say no. I, I think um, their, their fiscal gaps changed quarterly based on what their estimates are and the, the gap last year there was a six billion dollar gap in the plan that was pre-pandemic but then the gap grew to 16 billion uh, because of the pandemic and they they did a whole bunch of uh, actions at the state level including the medicaid redesign they did 
the cuts to counties they did, the $250 million sales tax diversion, all of those things were done to fill the gap. Um, and then they lowered their revenue estimates after the fact, and they built that into the financial plan and reflected our gap is this big based on lower revenues on top of all the cuts we're doing. So the fact that the gap dropped a little bit this year in the latest thing, that's really, the higher revenue is off a much lower base. So in my opinion, there's no way that the state benefited from the pandemic. Okay, and Dave, our next question is regarding sales tax equity for vacation rentals. Is there any discussion about extending this to bed tax as well? Get all the taxes done at once and eliminate the need for individual agreements with Airbnb and VRBOs and county by county state legislation. That's a good point. Um, I'll, I'll speak from my perspective that that um, has been discussed behind the scenes. It's yet to be seen whether or not that more comprehensive bill gets introduced and moves anywhere in the legislature. But Dave, I don't know if you have anything additional to add beyond that. No, I don't. Okay. Uh, the next question is, for those counties currently funding aimed to municipalities with sales tax intercept dollars, will those counties see a reduction in that intercept translating to a year to year increase in sales tax revenue, all else being equal? Yeah, uh, for some counties, they'll, it'll, there'll be an increase. It'll be pretty minor. Um, I mean, it, it could just be a few thousand dollars or a few hundred thousand dollar difference. It's small for most counties, the savings. All right. And our last question here is whether or not there's any indication regarding timeline as to when DOB will finalize EF back reconciliation for prior state fiscal years. There are a number of years and funding still outstanding. Have you heard of any updates from the division of budget on when that money will be released? No, no unfortunately we have not. We continue to ask the question. They, they are currently four years behind. The, the last reconciliation was for state fiscal year 15, 16, and they're still trying to determine what is owed. Um, from the the remaining reconciliations in the in the period in between, and they have not given us a final date. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, Stephen, that concludes uh, the questions here. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Jeanette to close out uh, the webinar. you're muted. All right, everyone. Well, I just do want to recognize uh, Airbnb once more um, for, for sponsoring uh, this webinar. And again, we apologize for that technical issue in the beginning, but Airbnb is an online platform that provides a people-to-people -people marketplace for unique accommodations around the world. The Northeast, the Northeast Public Policy Team works to ensure clear and fair rules for home sharing in New York in collaboration with community and government stakeholders throughout the state and region. Kelly Fay, who um, represents the Northeast region is listed here with her contact information if you do have questions. And uh, again, thank you for everyone for participating um, and take care again, a recording of this presentation and uh, slide deck will be available on the NYSAC website. Thank you so much.